Jesus cares who you are as he looks at the heart. Religion rolls her eyes when a girl walks in with a short skirt because she's not quite figured out life. Well, Jesus didn't even blink an eye. Religion looks at the outside, Jesus looks at the inside. Religion, you need to behave before you belong. With Jesus, you already belong before you behave. Religion stays in the grave. With Jesus, you raise with amazing grace. Religion wants you to do better. Jesus wants you to be better. Religion only spends time with the selected few. Jesus spends time with the anybodies, the nobodies, the somebodies, the me's and you's, the prostitutes, the gangsters, the outcasts, the misfits. Religion is God's love with misprints. The messages I always get is, Stephen, I'm not religious. And I'm like, ha, me too. And they're like, that's funny because we see you preaching, praying, reading your Bible and attending church. But I'm like, that's not how it works. You see, religion is known about God. True Christianity is actually known God. You can know all the facts about your favourite celebrity, but does that mean you actually know them? It's like saying you know all the greats in history because you study them. Religion sees the Bible with a list of do's and don'ts. With Jesus, it's a love letter telling you how to get the best out of life. Jesus loves you as you are, but far too much for you to stay the same. That's why with Jesus, you will never be the same. Religion comes for the powerful, the wealthy, the somebodies. Jesus comes for the lost, the broken, the weary, the nobodies. Religion says, don't you dare mess up. Jesus says, I'll pick you up when you mess up. At church, religion will have people leave politely. Well, Jesus will have the doors open widely with a sign saying sinners invited. Religion says, I'm better than you, I'm not good enough. Like saying dying on the cross wasn't enough, when we know it was more than enough. In religion, I've had enough. Stop trying to fix things with glue. The healthy don't need a doctor, the sick do. Religion wants you to be perfect with so many boxes to cross. But Jesus had one mission, to come and seek and save the lost. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Did you guys get an opportunity to go to the small groups this morning? Did you forget? <laughs> That's okay. Don't forget. Uh, I think we have an announcement about it, but I'll go ahead and mention that since I just said it. Uh, there are small groups starting now between uh, 8.45 and 9.45 in the morning. Uh, we'd love to have you. We have a men's group and a women's group. Just stop on in. No commitment. You know, pop in, pop out, whatever you'd like to do. It's a very, very informal meeting, but we'd love to have you. So think about that for next Sunday and moving forward, and we'll go to some announcements. Ah, well, thank you, Mike. We have got through that one. <laughs> Our newest service for time obviously begins at 10 p.m. I know it's a little strange for everybody. It's 15 minutes later. What is that? Did I say PM? <laughs> if you want to come at 10 o'clock tonight, you're welcome. The church will be here, and uh, we'll have you at 10 o'clock tonight. I'm sorry. It is AM, obviously, at 10 AM. Uh, new service time begins. We're all here. We all made it. Thank you for coming this morning. Uh, but it is 15 minutes later so that we can have our small groups, which uh, we had a good time this morning. If you weren't there, we do want to encourage you to come to that. Uh, the Bible study, the Gospel according to Matthew, is still going on on Tuesday nights. That's with Dave Collada at 6.30 on Tuesday nights. If you've not been a part of that yet, it's a wonderful, wonderful time. They're doing uh, amazing things in the Gospel of Matthew right now, so come be a part of that. We encourage you. Pastor Jesse would like to remind everyone that uh, he would love to see each and every one of you personally. Uh, come make an appointment with him through the church office, through Terry, and uh, we'll set up a time where you guys can get together and have a face-to-face -face sit down with Pastor Jesse. He would love to have that from each and every one of you guys. Our youth groups, Thursday nights from 5 to 7. This is for anybody in the church that's ages 10 to 19. Uh, we have a great time on Thursday nights. We do lots of different games. Our youth group is growing slowly, thank goodness. And uh, yeah, so that is actually p.m., 5 p.m., and uh, from 5 to 7, we have a good time. So if you're in that age range or know somebody who is, please bring them out on Thursday night so that we can all worship together. The Crosby School Supply Drive is still going, out, still going on out in the lobby. Uh, if you guys have not donated to that, we encourage you to do so. Uh, there's a list out there of things that they're accepting for the Crosby Schools. We would appreciate you dropping off any of those supplies. There's a new thing this morning. I uh, just got informed about, of it about one minute ago. 
there's a quilt, I believe, out in the lobby there uh, that's for um, a Corporal Kelsey Lanehart, I believe that is. I'm sorry if I messed that up. Um, she's back from Afghanistan. She's a wounded warrior. Please tie a knot on the quilt and say a prayer for her because they're going to send that to her. So it's very important that we support our wounded warriors, especially from Afghanistan in this time. So please take a minute to do that. Say a prayer and tie a knot on the quilt today so we can get that to her. All right. At this time, we'll turn service over to Pastor Jesse. Hey, good morning, everybody. Glad to have you here with us today. If you would, uh, let's stand as we begin our worship service, focusing our hearts on the Lord through our call to worship. Happy are the people who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that the wicked follow. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's law day and night. Yes, he does. Our, our God is good. He watches over the way of the righteous. And because we have tasted of God's goodness, we can't help but thirst to know him more, even to long for him as the deer, the thirsty deer, pants for water. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Yes, our God is an awesome God. To know God is to love God. At this time, we'd like to invite all the children down front from Children's Church for a message this morning. 
How are you guys today? It's good to see you. I'm so glad you're back with us this morning. So let's talk about for something for a second. So all of you guys by now, who's got through their summer break? Raise your hand. We're back to school? Yes? Maybe? Okay. Yeah, we're back to school. Cool. So since you've gone back to school, imagine you guys have spent a lot of time reading, writing, doing homework, right? All the fun stuff of school. Not really, but, you know, we got to tell them that, right? <laughs> Even when you get done with school and life, there's always going to be more for you to learn. The Bible teaches us that we should be filled with knowledge and wisdom. Do you guys know the difference between knowledge or wisdom? Any idea? It's hard to understand. Let's, let's talk about it for a second. So let's imagine you're in a school library, and you see all the books around you, and you can read all the books in the library. You would have a lot of knowledge, right? But it does, doesn't necessarily mean you'll have a lot of wisdom. Knowledge means we have it up here in our head. Wisdom means we actually know what to do with the knowledge that we learn. Some people have a lot of knowledge, but they don't have a lot of wisdom. In the book of Matthew, Jesus tells us, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. But everyone who hears my words and does not put them in practice is like a foolish man and builds his house on sand. Some people know a lot about Jesus and what he taught, and they put those teachings into practice every day in their life. Jesus said those people are like the wise man who built his house on a rock. So when the storms of life come against his house, it stands. Then there are some people, especially in the church, who know a lot about Jesus and his teachings, but they don't put them to practice in his life. Jesus said, they are like the foolish man who builds his house on, stand, on sand. When the storms of life come, what happens to his house? It falls down. That's right. It goes splat. It blows away. Jesus wants us to come to church and learn about him, but that's not all. He also wants us to take what we learn and apply it to our daily life. That's knowledge and wisdom. So think about this. As you go home throughout this week, I want you to think about all the things that you've learned in church here today and throughout the weeks and things you've learned about Jesus and see how you can apply those things to your life. Then you will have knowledge of Jesus and wisdom. Sound good? Great. I'll let you guys go to your workers or children's church. Thank you. If you happen to be watching us through Facebook Live this morning, we're glad to have you as a part of our worship service. Also, um, we're thankful for, for your uh, support of, of the church uh, just through joining us in worship. Uh, I want you to know if you're watching through video, you're in a nursing home, uh, you're shut in, uh, we're thinking of you, and you're, you're in our thoughts and our prayers this morning. If you would, uh, join me in time of prayer as uh, we go to our Lord. Holy Lord, we need the kind of wisdom, wisdom that you can give to us in every day of life. There are moments, God, when all of us are pressed through the trials and struggles that life brings to us. There are times that we find ourselves in life facing decisions and choices to be made that we've never had to make before. We've not had any kind of rehearsal and we desperately need your wisdom. For some among us here today, God, we pray for your wisdom in the decisions that we make this day and this upcoming week. And we pray, God, for your wisdom uh, for the leaders of our church, that you would uh, grant us, God, to make those decisions that would be pleasing to you. And we ask, God, that you would do a, a work in our life 
that you would clean our hearts. And as we walk with you and look inside of ourselves, we ask that you would help us to remove anything in us that is unlike Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you would cleanse us and forgive us through your grace. And we confess our sins to you, God. We confess our sins and we mean it from our hearts. We all know that we have sinned before you and fallen short of your glory. And we all know, God, that there are times that we failed you. There are times that we failed others who depended on us. And there's times that we even failed ourselves. Forgive us, Lord. We do, as your people, seek to be holy even as you are holy. We seek to be pure, even as you are pure. Help us, God. When we are harmed or hurt, to be able to forgive. Help us to have the kind of love that you do that doesn't demand a pound of flesh when we're done wrong, but help us truly to be merciful and peace-loving people. God, there may be families or marriages or other things that are going on in people's lives right now, bringing them stress at this time. Maybe they're going through a time of strife or a time when a personal injury let us discover in our own needs God how you saved us how you submitted so that through love and submission we may lay aside our anger that we may lay aside our sinfulness so that we may experience your healing in our hearts and God, we do want the wisdom that comes from above. We wouldn't be here today had we not wanted to seek you. Had we not wanted to say that as the deer thirst for the water, our souls, God, do thirst for you. Be the Lord of our lives, every part of it. We pray and we Ask these things together in Christ's name, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One of the joys that we have as God's people is celebrating God's love and faithfulness and, and care for us. So we take time this morning uh, to give an offering, a gift from our hearts back to God, uh, thanking him for his provision and his care. And if you're watching uh, through video today, uh, just want to remind you, if you would like to give and uh, support the work of the church, you can go on our uh, website and go to mymw.org and click the Give tab, and it will help you uh, be able to make a gift to the church. Thank you. Uh, and at this time, let's give to the Lord freely even as he is give, given to us.
again for our call to worship. Gracious God, we pray that you would grant us the grace to be extravagant in the gifts that we give to you. Guide us, God, in the way to lives that bear the fruit to live lives that bear the fruit that is pleasing to you. Enable us, God, by your grace to have more than enough so that we can be people of mercy and compassion. We pray in the love and hope Amen. If you would, let's remain standing and join uh, together in this uh, hymn of praise that's also a great prayer in a sign of wisdom, asking God to let there be peace on our earth. Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to continue in our study of the book of James this morning. The title of my message is The Wisdom That Is From Above. We just looked at uh, James 3, chapter James chapter 3, uh, the verses uh, 1 through 10 last week. And last week was kind of a, uh, literally a hard message to swallow because uh, James touched on the subject of our tongues and, and how often um, that our tongues can be used uh, to wound and, and to hurt each other. Uh, and this week's text uh, James chapter 3, verses 11 through 18, James reminds us of our need uh, to have wisdom, to have wisdom in the works that we do, 
to have wisdom in the prayers that we pray, uh, to have wisdom with how we conduct ourselves in our everyday lives. And particularly, since James is talking to teachers at, in chapter 3, verse 1, he's especially speaking to church leaders because these folks that wanted to be teachers were also leaders uh, in the church. So he, he writes these words uh, to those, to everyone. They apply to everyone, but especially uh, to leadership. Beginning at verse 11. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you? He's asking this question. Who's wise? Who has wisdom among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, the kind that boasts and lie against the truth, but it is earthly, it's sensual, and he dare call it demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above, that is from God, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let us pray. Lord, I ask that you would bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. I pray, Lord, that you would grant my words be acceptable in your sight. And may your words give to us strength and courage that we might follow you faithful as your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was younger and in better shape, I used to love to ride roller coasters. And my favorite part of the roller coaster ride was always at the beginning when, when uh, you would get on at first and you, you, you'd get on the track and slowly you would go up that track. And depending on how big the roller coaster was, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking of the beast. I really loved the beast uh, that they had at King's Island. Great ride. It, it, it's worth the long line because the ride lasts at least five minutes, so that's why it was my favorite. Well, anyway, you, you get up to the top of that, and in some ways, you felt like you were more than human because you can look around you and see as far as the eye can see. You know, there's nothing greater than being on the peak, the peak of a, a high-up roller coaster or up in a high mountain uh, at the highest point when you're allowed with your naked eye to see everything that's around you. It was suspenseful at that moment. It was thrilling. Oftentimes, I'd be in the front car and just be waiting at any moment for that ride to take off. That was the time when the ride finally did take off. You knew you better hang on because you were in for the ride of your life. Well, we kind of reached that same point in the book of James right now. Up to this point, James has kind of been building to take us to the peak, to actually begin to descend into the uh, message of the text. And ultimately, everything James wrote before this was to get to this place. Everything that he writes after this was to point back toward it. Ultimately, James wrote this book to point believers toward the importance of having the wisdom of God in the church. And of course, we know James wasn't writing to perfect Christians. 
He, he knows there is arguing and fighting among them. In chapter 4, he even says that there's wars going on among them. I, I don't particularly know exactly what he meant by that, but it doesn't sound good. The word war is not a good word, but it's used in some translations. They were talking to each other in bad ways. I mean, that's why he wrote about the tongue. We looked at that last week. They were using their tongues as, as weapons against each other. And apparently they got into some verbal disagreements. And ultimately, there was conflict going on among themselves. You look at chapter 3, verse 1, and James warns them. He said, be careful if you want to be a teacher. Just know if you're, if you're fighting for this leadership position, you're fighting for a position uh, in which others hold you in high regard, he said, just know that God's going to judge you at a higher level. So he's warning uh, these leaderships, uh, folks to, uh, that are wanting to be in charge, you want more authority, but just remember, there's accountability that's going to come with it too. So there was a difference. There was difference in the congregation. Every congregation has differences. Most of us can look past our differences, work together. But there was major differences in this church. And one of the differences, the main difference was how they looked at life. James says there was one group of people who were trying to live by the wisdom of, of God, the word of God, trying to follow Christ's example. He said they're following the wisdom that's from above. And then he also said there was another group of people in the same church that were following this wisdom from below. And he said this folks who are walking in this wisdom from below are full of jealousy. He, he says, full of envy, full of bitterness. They're full of trying to grab for a place of position and power because they're walking according to this wisdom of the world where, where I want to be number one and I want to have my way. So, of course, it brought some disagreement about that. So James writes to this church and he says, I'm going to point out to you what I think is the major problem that's going on about how you look at life, your philosophy. First of all, he says their thoughts originate in different places. You know, if you have um, two different sets of school, people have different ways of thinking. Well, these folks had a major difference in their way of thinking. One was from God, and the other, James says, was demonic. So this was major differences in how they looked at the things of God. And in verse 15 uh, of the text here, he says, The wisdom, this wisdom, does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. That's the wisdom that some of them were living by. But then he compares that to God's wisdom. He says God's wisdom isn't earthly. It isn't demonic. It isn't bad. He said the wisdom that comes from God is what? Pure. Pure. It's good. It's, it, it, it yields fruit like peace and gentleness. So if you have peace and gentleness with each other, obviously the wisdom of God is at work. So James knew, looking at this, that they were uh, operating under two different thought systems. There's a man-made wisdom that doesn't come from God and actually competes against the wisdom of God. The wisdom of our world says things like, promote yourself. You're, you're better than the next guy. Says things like, I'm going to be the loudest and most squeakiest wheel until somebody pays attention to me. The, this wisdom is also referred to by John in his writings, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, as worldliness. I hear a lot of Christians who can talk about worldliness but it's hard to define what is worldliness. Well, it's the kind of thing that says, this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and we're all in competition with each other. Worldliness is when you're so competitive that political parties split, and one group becomes pitted against each other. They both become pitted against each other. Worldliness is when upper management meets with lower workers, and there's a clash between 
who's going to be treated fair when they're met at the table? In the social world, there are people who are seeking to go up the social ladder. They want to be number one in the social ladder. So you know what they do? They step on a lot of other people's hands as they climb. Worldliness is the kind of thing that talks, that makes one neighbor not talk to another neighbor who live right next door to each other. It's the kind of thing that makes brother turn against brother. James tells us it's selfish, it's prideful, it's greedy in its promotion of itself. That's worldliness. It's competition. It's a spirit of competition seeking to be number one and to have the most. And, and, and that's the way our world operates outside. But James says, you guys have made a mistake because you've allowed this same spirit of competition in the world around you come inside the church. And it's creating division within the church. A perfect example of this is when the disciples started arguing amongst themselves. They started arguing, worldly spirit, oh, who's number one among us? Oh, we're going to sit at the right hand of Jesus when he takes his power. And remember, Jesus, when he heard this stuff, he was upset with them. Worldliness. They were, they were thinking on the things of this world, earthly power, earthly wealth. That's why it was so hard for them to say, you can't die. Remember, Peter pulled Jesus to the side when Jesus said he was going to die, and he said, you can't do this, Lord. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. Your mind isn't on the things of God, but on the things of man. That's worldliness when you live your heart not seeking the kingdom of God, but seeking the kingdom of man. In other words, I'm going to build my own kingdom in this world. It's not wise to do that because at any moment you take your last breath, you lost everything. But that's what worldliness does. I'm going to build my own kingdom. I'm going to build my own wealth. And if it means stepping all over you to do it, then that's just the way it's going to be. Well, there was this kind of conflict. Worldliness says that the preaching of the gospel is foolishness. It ain't believable. They reject the gospel. But in the church, we say we're not ashamed of the gospel because why? It's the power of God on the salvation. That's the spirit we compete against. Spirit in the world rejects the gospel of Christ. But the spirit of the church, of course, accepts it. Our wisdom is from above. Our wisdom comes from Jesus through his cross. And the non-believer, of course, rejects it. We look up to heaven for what we need. We look up to heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our Father is in heaven. We were born again with a heavenly birth, Jesus said, a new birth. Our home is in heaven. Jesus said he's preparing a place for us. People that live after God's spirit, live with their hearts, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, seeking to build God's eternal kingdom, the one that the Bible says will stand forever and ever. Forget building my kingdom. I build my kingdom, it won't last very long. But if I build God's kingdom, it's going to make an eternal difference. We're to have our affections set on things above. Colossians says, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is setting. Well, worldliness is the spirit that tells us you only need to seek the things of God and Christ maybe for an hour on Sunday morning and an hour on Wednesday night. But in between, you live just like everybody else. And you compete with everybody else. Well, as Christians, we're not to be in competition and power struggles. We're supposed to be living in the fear of the Lord, knowing that Jesus is our king, knowing that his word is our constitution, knowing that his Holy Spirit is to be our source of wisdom. Yes, all of us struggle with worldliness at times because we have sin that lives within us. It's hard to get the world out of us because we live in it. And it's in our hearts 
So there's a battle that goes on between God's spirit in our life and our own worldliness. We struggle. James knew that. That's why he wrote, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all freely. Jesus himself taught that there were two sources of wisdom. If you were listening to Daniel's children's message, he touched on it. Jesus said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them is like a man who will build his house on the rock. And the storms of life will come, but that house will stand. But he said, there's another group of people live after the wisdom of this world. They're going to hear these sayings of mine, and they're not going to pay any attention to them. They're going to build their house on their own thoughts and their own plans. Life is about fulfilling my dream. But Jesus said they get disappointed. Things fall apart because the storm of life comes. And what happens? He says they built their house on sand, which is what the wisdom of the world is the foundation. It's sand. And he said when the storm comes, great was its fall. You know why it's great? Because if you spend all your life loving things, and you lose them, then you've lost everything you love. The Bible talks about this. Love people, use things. Love people, but use things to love them. So many of us have the spirit of the world where I love things and I'm going to use people to get it. I'm going to walk all over you to get it. That's the spirit of the world, and it goes on all around us. Next, James tells us not only is the source of this wisdom differently, one's from heaven, one's from below, was the term he used, demonic. He also says that they operate differently. God's kingdom operates differently than Satan's kingdom. There's a difference between dark and light. And he tells us this is how the demonic kingdom of our world works. Who is wise and understanding, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. That's God's kingdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. That's how the kingdom of this world operates. On their pride, jealousy, boasting, lying against the truth, unwilling to accept the gospel. James then says, the wisdom that's from above. It's not full of lies. It's not full of bitterness, not full of envy. He says it's first pure, then peaceable, then gentle. You know why we don't have peace in the world? Because we live by the world's wisdom. But if we lived by God's wisdom, we would have greater peace. So there's a contrast in how they operate. The kingdom of this world originates from a different source, and it operates in a different way than the kingdom of God. Look at our, our world that we live in. I'm going to talk about America right now, our culture. We as Christians, we live in this culture. Sometimes we're blind to the impact that this culture has on us. These are the things that our culture values. The culture's materialism. We want things. It costs us it, call, it, it values attention. The more attention I can get, the better for me. Give me a million likes on Facebook. We desire power and status. We're careless about other people, especially people we don't know. Our world values aggression. Our world lives by assumption. The spirit of the world lives by assumption. We don't know about someone, and we don't bother to even find out. We simply make assumptions about people. We judge them on superficial grounds without really getting to know them. Think of how, that's how things operate. I looked at your Facebook page, buddy. I listened to your sermon. I know all about you now. You're my enemy. We're quick to put walls up. That's how our world operates. And when we live in a culture of these values, before you know it, the values in the culture become the values in you. And you can't tell the difference between if you're living in God's kingdom or if you're living in this kingdom from below. Envy means you desire to take something away from someone else. You think they have it, they don't deserve it, 
and I want it. Envy. It's like jealousy. James says, if you're walking with God, you shouldn't have bitter water and spring water coming from the same heart. You shouldn't have bitterness and jealousy coming out on one side and envy and jealousy coming out on the other side of your life. A lot of people believe that he or she's worth is derived from what they have. If I have a lot, I'm worth a lot. If I don't have much, then that must mean my life ain't worth much. And look, that's how the world operates. We're going to cater to the rich. Look, James addressed this in the church. He said, rich people come, you bring them up to the best seat and say, sit right here. He said, poor people come in, you take them to the back and you say, here, sit at my feet. That same spirit works in the church right now. We value wealth. We, we treat people as if they are what they have. Jesus said, you're, not, you're more than what you have. You're who you are in your heart. That's who you are. On the other hand, God's people lead lives of purity, holiness, peace. As God's people, we don't judge ourselves based on what we have. We judge ourselves based on who we are. Who we are. If we're children of God, we're eternal beings going to live with God forever. James says that the evil tongue speaks evil because it's set on fire with the fires of hell. Did he not say that? And just as the fires of hell are the source of the evil tongue, the wisdom of God comes from outside itself. It comes from God's spirit. And we have to, we have to decide which one. Holy living is evidence that we're walking with, in wisdom and with God. The Bible says without holiness, no man, no person will see the Lord. Here, James, listen to him echo the teaching of Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall, what? See God. Oh, there's nothing in this life that I value more. There's nothing in this life I will let strip away from me seeing God. I want to see God more than I want to take the next breath because to know God is to love God and there is nothing greater than getting to know him. Martin Luther tells a story about two goats that came across each other. They came across each other on the same path and they didn't want to fight because they were on this bridge up over high water and they knew if they fought, one of them would fall off that bridge and die. So as they stood there and looked at each other for a couple minutes, one of the goats finally squatted down, knelt down on the ground, and let the other goat just walk on him and cross over safely from the other side. The moral of the story, according to Luther, be content if your person is trod upon for peace's sake. Jesus said, blessed are you if you're persecuted for righteousness. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for these are the sons of God. Jesus allowed his person to be walked on for peace's sake. But don't allow your conscience to be walked on. A lot of us Christians, we allow our conscience to be walked on. And we allow evil to go on around us. And we don't say anything. We like to tell ourselves, I'm not saying it because I don't want to hurt that person's feelings. I'm not saying nothing because I want to keep peace. But ultimately, the reason we don't say nothing is because we're scared to. We don't want to have an unpleasant situation, right? Well, sometimes the unpleasantness of the situation has to be acknowledged because it's there. And if you're going to deal with the problem, you've got to acknowledge you have one. God never said peace at any price. He never said peace at any price. The peace of the church is not more important to God than the purity of the church. The wisdom from God is, first of all, pure. So if we find in the church impure things, we're to confront that. It's not peace at any price. 
If the church is pure and devoted to God, peace will come as a result. But we can't sweep things under the rug. We can't sweep sins under the rug and pretend like they're not there because even if we ignore them, they're still going to be there. And God is not going to ignore it. Third, James talks about the outcomes. There's different outcomes depending on which wisdom you live by. He says, for where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. I don't like confusion. And I don't like going through bad things. But he said, this is the result when you live by the wisdom of the world. But then he says, when you live by God's wisdom, there is the fruit of righteousness. And he said, it is sown in peace by those who make peace. Worldly wisdom results in worldly things. Spiritual wisdom will result in spiritual things. James tells us ultimately, we got to beware of this wisdom of the world because it's got evil as inside of it. You know, if I baked a, a cake, but I just put a little bit of dirt in it, but the whole cake looks nice. I mean, it's chocolate icing. I'll give you ice cream. Would you take some of that cake if you knew there was some dirt in it? Even just a little bit? No. No. And here James is warning us, the things of the world, they're deceptive. Wrong thinking produces wrong living, bitterness, resentment, arguing. And James 4, I'm going to help you go home and read James 4 this week. James talks about war, war and fighting going on in, in, in the church. Why? Because wrong thinking was producing wrong living in the church. The evil had come in and infected their attitudes. And because they had evil attitudes filled with envy and selfishness and greed and boastfulness, the church was destroying itself from the inside out. On the other hand, James says, if you live for God, it's going to bring about good. It's going to bring about eternal righteousness. You know what pleases God most about the church? Not the size, necessarily. Not how much money we have. It's our purity. It's if we live holy lives. The Bible says Christ is coming back for a pure church, a holy church. You know what pleases God is when we seek to have peace among each other within the church, when we treat each other merciful and forgiving and gentle, as James mentions in this text. He knew if these people would begin to change their attitude, their problems would change. You know what pleases God? When we live righteous and holy, we are a witness to the world that something is real. When they look at us and they see the love, Jesus said by this, all men will know you're my disciples because you love one another. He says, own believers will take note of that. You know why? Because there's so little love out there. I mean, really. Get out into the world, no one, half people don't care what your name is. Walk all over each other. The Lord said in the church, that's not the spirit you're supposed to bring. Love each other. Be willing to allow yourself to be walked on if it's going to be to the good for your brother. Conversion isn't a one-time process. You've been lied to. There's people that say, say this little prayer, you'll be saved forever. Well, that's kind of true, but it's kind of not. Conversion is more than just saying one prayer. Conversion is saying prayer every day, prayer after prayer after prayer. And, it, and conversion is being transformed day after day, week after week. It's allowing God to show you your sin and saying, God, forgive me, help me do better. It's allowing God to help us grow in our holiness. It's never complete as long as we're in this world. I warn you, don't be double-minded. 
James says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It's so easy to become double-minded. We'll operate one way in the church, and as soon as we go out of doors, we'll operate another way. We're double-minded. The wisdom from below isn't easy to avoid. You know why? It's the way of the world. It's hard to avoid. We just need to learn to recognize it when it's trying to get into us. It surrounds us. The wisdom of this world is in the music of this world. It's in the books of this world. It's in the movies of this world. Always trying to give us their message. And it's normally anti-Christian, anti-Scripture, anti-Christ. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence. So how are you doing in your Christian walk? If God were to evaluate your Christian walk, how would he answer this question that James asked? Are you walking in the wisdom? Are you living a a skillful Christian life? As we seek to grow in our walk with God, we need to be determined to live our lives according to God's wisdom, not this world's opinion. Notice what this world's opinion does. It shifts and changes every day. One thing's right today, next week it's wrong. Always changing. There is no absolute truth. Truth is what we say it is. Yeah, try, try to have a football game with rules like that. We make them up as we go. Well, I'm so thankful for God's word. It doesn't change with man's opinion. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The Bible says that this world and everything in it will pass away, but Jesus said, my words will go on forever. Go on forever and ever. Let's not be deceived by this world. Let's not live for things that are going to burn up someday and not be worth nothing. Let's live for God's righteousness. Let's live for God's peace. Let's live doing what Jesus has commanded us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, all the things that you really want, when you don't even know what you want. I didn't even know what I wanted in life. And the Lord said to me, seek first my kingdom and the things that you really want, I'll give to you. Oh, I thank God I don't have everything. I thank God he didn't answer some of the prayers I prayed because in the end, God knew I didn't need them and I really didn't want them. Seek first God's kingdom. And he says, all the other things of life will be added unto you. Amen. If you would, uh, let us pray together. Father, we need your kind of wisdom. We live in the world that's that has the evil one loose, has demons spreading the wisdom of this world to deceive and and to lead astray. How, How we need your light, God. How we need your Holy Spirit to show us those things in the dark so that we can be aware of them and and expose them and not allow them to attack our souls and attack our church. And God, we do pray for your wisdom. We ask as we study your word that you will speak to us through it, that you would grant us your direction and guidance and decisions to be made this week and also in the days and weeks to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, let's stand and join together in our closing hymn. I chose this hymn because it is the way that we receive the wisdom of God. We surrender the things of this life to attain the things of the life to come.
I was, I was not saying that part of the verse that says, take me, Jesus, take me now, because I wasn't ready to go to heaven at that point. <laughs> it took me a little while to figure it out. It just means take me right now, not take me to the other side. Now, may the love of God, the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit, who indwells you and gives you wisdom and insight as you walk with him. As you go, may you go knowing that God will be with you in all that you say and do. Go in his peace. Amen.